They say you have to be a little crazy to be a boxer. After all, why type of person willingly signs up to fight another human? But the same could be said of being a boxing fan. For just as with Christmas, we don't always get what we want. And yet, year after year, this sport filled with crazy characters continues to deliver enough insanity to keep us afloat. Oh my! It's a drug that never gets old. In this video, we'll look back at what 2022 had to offer, from the majestic to the downright disgusting. And it's unfortunate that we had that on our air live. That is disgusting. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Box's most shocking moments of 2022. It's often said that one should live in the moment, and no other boxer encapsulates that today more than Tyson Fury, a man who does and says what he pleases. The world has gone mad. There is no morals, there is no loyalty, there is no uh, nothing. Listen to the government, follow everybody like sheep, be brainwashed. Fury seems to take things as they come, and perhaps that's what makes him so deadly. In 2015, he'd managed to troll long-reigning champion Vladimir Klitschko, and had him second-guessing himself at every turn merely by being himself. He's been made to look like that. Everything he does is manufactured. Everything I do is natural, off the cuff. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm relieved, relaxed, but alert. Let's not just, let's just be normal. Let's forget all the acting and all that. Calm yourself down, Charlie. Relax, you know. And to you, Fury, I want to say, fuck off. Seems that Vladimir has found his bollocks from somewhere and swore. Fucking hell. After a two-year vacation indulging in food and drugs, Fury convinced the undefeated title holder Deontay Wilder that he was ripe for the picking, only to give him a harder fight than expected and route to a disputed decision that saw him robbed of a victory. Then in the rematch, Fury beat Wilder in such dominant fashion that he mentally broke the fragile psyche of the Americans' followers, forcing them to conjure tales of mischief as the reason behind their king's loss. We gonna steal you people's necks when it comes to this gloves conspiracy because Tyson Fury cheated his way and stole those belts from Deontay Wilder. But he didn't win it fairly. He definitely cheated. There's no doubt about that. Man, I got I got physical proof that this man cheated. And it's doctor approved. Entering 2022, fans were hoping that Fury would face the undefeated Ukrainian title holder Alexander Uzik. Uzik had upset British star Anthony Joshua in 2021 and was looking to fight for all the marbles. Fury, meanwhile, had dispatched of Wilder in a fun yet unnecessary rubber match, one which saw him touch the canvas twice. But Anthony Joshua, after some meandering, activated his rematch clause against Usyk, thus leaving Fury out in the fray. Thus, the WBC ordered him to find the long-waiting contender, Dillian White. With a record of 28 wins, 2 losses and 19 knockouts, the fellow Brit was a dangerous opponent. After having lost to his nemesis Anthony Joshua in a battle of undefeated prospects back in 2015, White had barged his way through a line of heavyweights, ranging from sluggers to boxers, all in the hopes of getting a second shot at his now world-famous enemy. In 2020, White suffered a setback at the hands of the always dangerous Alexander Povetkin. White got his revenge in 2021, but had to wait once again, as he was forced to face Odo Wallin. However, the Brit dropped out days before the fight, claiming a shoulder injury. Some theorize that, after waiting seven years for a big fight and wishing to avoid another setback, White had feigned an injury. After all, Walin was a 6 foot 5 inch tall southpaw 
with giving Fury fits before losing a 12-round decision. But why would White risk another loss when a Fury or Joshua mega fight loomed so near? In the end, he failed to reschedule the Wallin fight, and negotiations with Fury began. From the start, things failed to go White's way, as a purse split for his bout with Fury went 80-20 against his favor. And so, the fight was set for April the 23rd in Wembley Stadium. Then, the day of the press conference, White went missing. His lawyer issued a statement indicating that negotiations remained unresolved. He's trying to renegotiate. Well, that's, that's why we had a, a, a period to agree terms. Now, one of the things was that he wanted a private jet to fly him in and out today, but we said yesterday we'll do that. In writing, we'll do that. Then they started adding other stuff to it. They didn't even want to let us use his photograph on a poster. You cannot use his image rights. I've never heard anything like it in my life. Fury, for his part, appeared unfazed. He's definitely shown the white flag in my estimation of this fight. He, he's the way he's going on about it. Oh, I don't want to go face to face with Tyson. Of course he don't. Because you see that fire in my eyes and you think I'm getting killed. I, I'm not concerned because this is the Tyson Fury Roadshow. Whether it's his face on there or somebody else's, it's really important. He's ugly anyway, it doesn't really matter. Take him down, we should take him down, Frank. And even when I'm put down in twice in the fourth round, I will get back up and knock a motherfucker out. He even went as far as saying that this would be his final fight. This was bizarre, seeing as how he'd yet to beat either Uzik or Joshua. But fans dismissed the statement, as he still had White in front of him. After all, White was a big strong heavyweight who possessed a good jab, strong body punching stock and concussive power. Fury knew this. He's a good fighter, Dylan White. He, um, he's a good, strong, solid man. He, he's, he's big, he's strong, he's tough, he's game. He, he's got a good punch on him, he's got good power, he's knocked out a lot of men. His comments were an indication that he wasn't taking his opponent lightly. And though Fury had been in control for most of the fight's build-up, a mighty slip-up reminded him to stay sharp. We, we were good friends together. We went out, we went out for a drink. We we ate together. We slept together. We, he was like he was a part of our team. Oh shit! I'm sorry. We slept in the similar surrounding, but not together, bro. Relax. Fury was considered the best heavyweight in the world, but many wondered if he'd become a bit overrated. After all, his win over Klitschko, which on top of being boring, had taken place seven years earlier. Since then, his best wins had been a pair of stoppage victories over the highly limited Wilder. Others pointed to the fact that Fury was liable to get hit with overhand shots, something the shorter White would look to exploit. Then, on the day of the weigh-in, Fury showed up at 255 and a half pounds. It wasn't quite the heavy lump of fat he'd been in the two Wilder fights, but it was still heavier than some people would have liked. Who was Tyson Fury kidding? From the start, Fury fainted while White attempted to catch him with overhand shots. Despite being heavy, Fury appeared too quick for White. Time after time, a sloppy White tried to barge in without fainting and ended up getting tangled up by Fury's orangutan arms. And when he tried to jab, White got plastered by Fury's own stick. Within the first four rounds, it was evident that Fury was in complete control. A frustrated White relegated his vaunted bodywork to the occasional shot and spent the majority of the rounds flailing away. In the sixth round, Fury did the fans a favor by blasting White with a right uppercut. Fury with the uppercut! What a punch! The right uppercut! White rose, but then staggered towards the referee. 
Fury had made the fight look so easy that he stuck to his promise of retiring. I think this is it. This might be the final curtain for the Gypsy King. And what a way to go out! But not long after, he returned looking to fight French contender Derek Chisora for an unnecessary third time. Then he retired again. Then he was seen stalking the Icelandic coastline looking to confront half-poor Bjorsson, a strongman competitor with severely limited boxing experience. Somewhere in between, Fury stayed sharp by fighting a taxi cab, and again, fans were left perplexed and disgusted. And as we're gonna see later on, this sordid story would only get worse. Yet despite his wacky antics, it was clear that underestimating Fury inside the ring proved a deadly task, especially since no one knew what he'd do next, least of all himself. In 2021, Jermel Charlo fought the undefeated Brian Castaño. On the line was Junior Middleweight Supremacy. And after 12 hard rounds, most people agreed that Castaño should have received the win. But fighting in his home state of Texas, Charlo received a generous draw. And so, the rest of the year passed by until May 2022, when the two men agreed to a rematch. Charlo was in a bit of a bind from a PR perspective. Despite being an entertaining fighter, he'd been unable to grasp a superstardom. On top of that, he'd pissed off the fanatical black races. You know the LBZ, whatever, the community gonna come, come attack me because I'm fucking with you, Ellie. But it's all cool. You are new on the planet compared to us. You just recently popped up on the planet. Every white man walking around is red. You know why you're red. We have no pigment in you. So now he couldn't play the race card for support. And so, wearing his Macho Man Randy Savage glasses, Charlo's patriotism miraculously resurfaced. God bless me with natural gifted talent because I'm a black African man from the USA. USA! 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 In America, every man is free to take care of his home and his family. Unfortunately, despite being a foreigner, Castaño actually attracted more supporters to the press conference. USA! USA! Okay, okay. On fight night, the bout played out like the first, with the shorter Castaño pressing forward, while Charlo waited to counter. In the second, Charlo began to clinch, and some wondered whether the pace was getting to him again. Both men continued throwing hard, but this time Charlo was replying immediately after catching a shot. The fight began to turn in the seventh round. Charlo continued moving, but Castaño appeared to be slowing. Moreover, he seemed uninterested or unable to evade left hooks. In the tenth round, a re-energized Castaño began to reconnect. But this time, his proclivity for catching left hooks finally caught up to him. And with that, Charlo had become the lineal junior middleweight champion of the world. Unfortunately, the win appeared to rub his twin underachieving brother, Jermall Charlo, the wrong way. With a healthy supply of undefeated contenders to choose from for his next defense, such as Sebastian Fundora or Israel Majumov, Charlo announced that he would be facing another unbeaten contender, Tim Zhu. But he would do so in 2023. Fans were perplexed about why the two parties would announce a fight half a year in advance. And some theorized that the faltering PBC group liked the budget to have one of their star boxers fight more than once a year. In any event, Charlo had become the de facto junior middleweight champion. 
and 2023 offered juicy matchups, so as long as he could fight more than once a year. Boxing is at its best when it's at its most dangerous. Fans love seeing slugfests, blood, drama, and of course, knockouts. The real sweet science here, no backfoot bitching. Oh my goodness. But the holy grail of boxing entertainment remains the elusive ring projectile. And although seemingly an ordinary fighter, with a record of 25 wins, 2 losses and 15 knockouts, Lee Wood was looking to make a statement. He'd made a mark in 2021, when he upset one of the top featherweight title holders, Zhu Ken. Lee Wood has the night of his life here Fantastic. in the Mansion Square Garden! Still, his skill set appeared limited, and the very dangerous sport of boxing grew even more so when he was spitted against the unbeaten Michael Conlon. Hailing from Ireland, Conlon served as a contrast to Wood's more rudimentary skills. He possessed a solid amateur record, had acquired a bronze medal in the 2012 Olympics as well as gold in the World Championships. He was an athletically gifted fighter, an elusive target who could confound with both speed and style. With that in mind, Michael and his brother Jamie beamed with confidence. Destiny. This is destiny. Going to the opponent's backyard, becoming a legend, ripping it away from him in front of his, his family, his friends. I'm there, uh, I'm going to talk my shit, I'm going to say what I need to say. He stutters, he says what he wants to say, tries to spit things out, wasn't making sense. I ain't going to knock him out to win. There's many ways I can win this fight, but... Um... It's working, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> It's working! Oh. He doesn't understand the pressures which come with fighting in your home city. It's going to be so, 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 so good when, when, when March 12th comes. No, good punch, slow feet, curly head, I'll punch your head in. Yeah. When Conlon's north of me, looking at me in the eyes slightly, he might be looking a different way. He's going to regret all this shit he talked. And the brothers had no qualms about going after Wood's coach, Ben Davidson, the most bullet trainer in boxing. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Davison in the place. Thank you. Well, and of course, works hard. He works hard. Leave him alone. Ben, you had this, to come. This, you weren't this. even meant to come, Ben. You took a day off Sorry, being the best, I'll hardest working in coach in the world to come here. You didn't believe he'd win the Reese Moon fight? No, I didn't yes, say that. Yes, you did. Yeah, no, not at all. That's a lie. No, it's not a lie. So that everything else that you'll say, I'll take as a lie. He's a really good coach. He's undefeated. I, I, I listened to him saying he's undefeated since 2016. He knows his own record as a coach which is uh, states, a, states an ego. <laughs> and I like Ben, but it, everything I stated it was true. We also have more proof, but I'm not going to let him go down. We have screenshots from text messages. But you don't believe in men, so don't worry about it, mate. But if it's you okay. can believe, if you relax, can, if you believe that, you just I'm not bothered. Mate, sorry. I'm not relax, bothered. Relax, relax, relax. You're the one who looks very relax, tense about relax, it. You look nervous. Relax. relax. From the start, Conlon reminded Wood of just how dangerous boxing could be. Oh! Rare turn from Michael Conlon at the end of the opening round. Wood somehow makes it to his feet. Oh, 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 Harry Dan. He's going to the body looking to switch up. In the second, he continued to stun his opponent. He's straight down to work. Oh, he's right again. Same left hand. Wood stood tall, but that was the problem as his chin remained up in the air. He can't stand there with his chin in the air because that left, looping over hand left, is coming straight to that chin. By the fourth, Wood was working the body, and he was inching his way back into the fight. Still, his chin remained in the air. Nearing the championship rounds, Conlon, ahead on all the scorecards, was still connecting with the cleaner shots. All the balance, the 
traded at the various press so, conferences. Huge left down from Michael Connor. Yeah, respect yeah. from both men here. No question about it. They've drawn it out of each other. And Wood had to string combos together to land his own. As the battle raged on, Wood's trainer, Ben Davidson, became a conspicuous figure, hanging onto the bottom rope and practically becoming the fourth man in the ring. Stay alive! Stay alive! No matter what occurs, I will find you. No matter how long it takes, no matter how far, I will find you. Strangely, no one from the commission ever warned him. In the tenth, Conlan heard Wood again, this time to the body. But Wood immediately replied. Being hurt only seemed to energize him. Carries this level of resistance as Lee Wood goes to and scores the knockdown. Then in the twelfth, it happened. Lee Wood is doing exactly what he needed to do, what I was asking him to do, and he's going for broke. Wood was overjoyed, but the celebration was short-lived. <laughs> no, we're kidding, we're kidding. Conlon was fine, he was fine. He even posed with Wood after the fight. The fact that both men showed respect after such a heated war of words and punches showed how humble most boxers can be. But it also displayed that boxing is at its best when it's at its most dangerous. What it refers to behaviorally is someone who does not have a conscience. At the right hand. Does not have remorse. Does not feel a sense of guilt about most of the bad things they do. In boxing, the word boogeyman is used to describe a fighter who's so good that others just won't fight him. Many usually point to elusive fighters as the best examples of this mythical figure. But the main reason many boxers aren't clamoring to fight these men isn't because they're afraid of them, it's because those fighters box in a negative style and they don't bring in much money. So they're more of a nuisance than a terror. Boxers are willing to take the risk of being outboxed for 12 rounds, but what many are really afraid of is to taste superhuman power. This is where Arthur Beterbiev comes in. With a record of 17 wins, all of them by knockout, Petrovyev not only fought like a monster, he also looked like one. A Russian amateur standout, Petrovyev had established himself as a wrecking ball, and stories flowed of sparring partners quitting because of his punching power. I, I talked to cats that been in the ring with, uh, with that cat a while ago, like so they people been telling me about his punching power, and what I heard about dudes that been in there with him, I heard stories that I never heard about. Damn, they're nobody, <laughs> except for a prime Mike Tyson. This is what this guy does, he busts you up while he's landing. He said that he is so hard, he can't even really spar a whole full three minute round in camp. He gotta cut it in half. And he gotta wear huge gloves. And then he paying guys a lot of money, they still don't show up. His power is different, like bone crushing type power. Lionel Thompson, who upset super middleweight contender Jose Uzcategui, said that he's never been hit as hard as he did sparring Beterbiev. I sparred with him a few times and that's by far the worst thing I've ever experienced in life. I've been hit by a car once when I was young and that's how I feel like sparring with him. Moreover, Alexander Uzik claims that Beterbiev was his toughest opponent in the amateurs. But Beterbiev was no mere puncher. Because of promotional issues, Beterbiev's career had faltered and he'd missed his chance at fighting men like Jean Pascal, Adonis Stevenson, Sergei Kovalev, and Saul Alvarez in 2019. But in that very year, he'd finally grasped his chance to unify against the undefeated Alexander Gvozdik, the man who had retired one of the top dogs in Adonis Stevenson. Everything he does comes with that brawling, thudding, mauling kind of presence. And despite having stopped mobile and skilled fighters like Gvozdik and Marcus Brown, Petrovyev had never been in with a fighter that could rival his punching power. Joe Smith, 
28 wins, 3 losses with 22 knockouts, although lacking the skills of Viterbi's two best opponents, hit far harder than either of them combined. And even in his losses against Sullivan Barrera and Dimitri Vivol, the American had demonstrated that he could hurt them at any moment. For many, Smith Jr. would have no choice but to trade with Viterviev. And even though he was the underdog, some believed that this would benefit him, considering the doubts about Viterviev's chin. The fight had also an extra level of significance for Viterviev, as it would give him a chance to upstage fellow title holder Dimitri Bivol, who was riding high after upsetting Saul Canelo Alvarez. From the start, Smith fought the way he should have, waiting at Beterviev and attempting to back him up. Joe Smith is right in front of Beterviev, which is fine to a point, but he cannot go to sleep. But Beterviev was not Bivol. They're closing seconds. Oh! Off balance and scores the knockdown does Beterviev! In the second round, without any other recourse, Smith Jr. continued pushing forward, hoping his power would bail him out once again. Beterviev had other plans. And so, after less than three rounds, Beterviev had handed Smith Jr. his first stoppage loss, and he'd done it not by running or clinching, but with skill and power, thus showing the definition of a true boogeyman. Boxers come in all sizes and styles. But the harsh reality is that some are more naturally talented than others. And whereas normal pugs have to labor to get themselves a decent payday, let alone a title shot, those gifted with speed and power make it seem easy. Like one of those jet pilots. Chris Colbert, 16 0 with six knockouts, was one such prodigy. The 25 year old was a solid defensive fighter with decent power and plenty of athleticism. Precisely the type of flash that creates excitement with boxing fans. In 2020, he decisioned the tricky Jezreel Corrales. And in 2021, he fought the Mongolian rider, Tukstad Nayambayar. In 2019, Nayambayar had given featherweight champion Gary Russell Jr. fits before losing a unanimous decision. Colbert did just as well as the Washington DC native, winning a decision and showing the world that he was ready for the best 130 pounders. In late 2021, Colbert became the mandatory for an alphabet trinket held by Roger Gutierrez. But two weeks before the fight, the Venezuelan dropped out of the fight due to health concerns. And so, the 2016 Olympian Hector Garcia was brought in to replace him. Despite having a record of 14 wins, 0 losses, with 10 knockouts, Garcia was already 30 years old and had yet to face anyone of Colbert's caliber. Unsurprisingly, the American came in with confidence. When I um, beat this guy right here, uh, I get to get him next. I'm, I'm a clown. I'm going to use him. I'm going to juggle with him on Saturday. And I'm going to give y'all a show. <laughs> See, 10 knockouts out of 14 fights. I, suppose, I don't know if that was supposed to scare me or what, but y'all yeah, know what I do. I don't know what I'm going to beat him with, but I know I'm going to beat his ass. To Colbert's credit, he was fighting for an organization combating autism, but that did little to quell his yapping. Moreover, he was committing one of boxing's cardinal sins, planning ahead for bigger fights. What do you see from Hector Luis Garcia? I don't know nothing about him, I, so I can't tell you what I see, but I know I'm going to dominate him and beat his ass. Gary Russell called you out and said you don't want no smoke with him. What's your response to that? I'm willing to give him an opportunity because I'm a dog. He's a dog. You know, you're going to be the next big superstar in boxing. I am the superstar in boxing, okay. yes. Yeah. From the start, Garcia stood in front of Colbert, shooting from all angles. 
And when Colbert stepped in, Garcia refused to concede. In the third, Garcia continued targeting the body. Colbert came in looking like a Rubik's Cube, but it was Garcia who was proving to be the more difficult puzzle. Colbert landed solid shots, but Garcia wasn't going anywhere. By the end of the fourth, Garcia was pushing on, and Colbert began to find himself on the wrong end of the action. Colbert tried to up the pace, but was met with further resistance. The fight was turning into a beating, but Colbert continued throwing. In the final round, however, behind on the cards, he decided to survive. The best way to describe Garcia on fight night was tenacious. He simply refused to stop whereas Colbert hit a wall that he was unable or unwilling to climb, proving that oftentimes boxing is about more than just natural talent. The sport of boxing has been accused of making big fights happen way past their expiration dates. But sometimes, if the animosity between the boxers is real, it can lead to an entertaining finale. Amir Khan and Kell Brook, two of the best British fighters of their era, were at one point top-level contenders in the welterweight division. The eyes of judges, incidentally, between Porter and Brook. Nice shots there by the challenger. But after taking big risks by moving up in weight in 2016, both men suffered stoppage defeats, and their careers were never the same. After some wins sandwiched between more losses, Brooke and Khan, now 35 years of age, finally agreed to cash out by engaging in their long-anticipated grudge match. The earliest accounts of their rivalry go back to 2004, when Khan, then an amateur, was preparing for the Olympics. A sparring session took place between him and Brooke, also an amateur at the time, and both men had different accounts of what transpired. You sparred before, haven't you? Yeah, we've sparred before. And, and Kel, I'll tell you about the sparring session. And I used to school Kel in the ring. I've never been, I've never been schooled ever. Oh, come on, Kel. And after that, you whoa, never whoa, heard whoa, from Kel, Brooke. You, not, you didn't, what, you give no. me a beating, how did that happen? Like, you'll see on Feb 19th how I played and schooled this guy. Just like the early days when I used to school him. Why, oh, like, never. why is it I got picked for the Olympic team because I was schooling Kel Brook with one hand? I used to be going to the training camp and the coach used to tell me, I mean, excuse one hand against him now. Obviously, I was the number one in the country. I was the one who was qualified. I was the one who won the world championships. And then they put this kid in. If he wasn't a beating, I don't know what you call it, it was a smashing up. Oh, I just walked out nice and easy. There's another like, sparring either, partner. Yeah. Like I said, there's another sparring partner. Like, I, I like give him this. a little slap I up like and get so off. This. When my timing come, you'll know what happened in that sparring. No one scored. You didn't school me. Oh, I've know. never been what? schooled. What is known is that Ken was the one to go to the Olympics. And after earning a silver medal, became a British sensation. Brooke, on the other hand, never achieved the same notoriety. This, Khan claimed, was the reason behind Brooke's jealousy. Oh, do you think you've spent most of your time obsessing about this part? I've been doing my thing, I'm just saying How that... How obsessed, Chris? I think Kel's always been very obsessed with my career. You know, he's been like a fanboy. And, you know, I've been living in his head for such a long time that I think it's going to come stage where he's going to say, I mean, he needs to stop paying me some rent. Well, but what, what about what? <laughs> I don't, I don't. We always got promised uh, that we would fight down the line. But like he said, he, he said in many interviews, like, oh, he's Kel, but I don't even, he didn't even say, he said that he didn't even know who I was. When you saw him in the jungle, what did you think? I How did you feel, show? 
He's a fan yeah. favourite show. He's become well, a fan of mine. He's my favourite show. I do love it. I do, you like I it? You, like you, 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 mentioned, you mentioned him as a fan. That's what you said. You said yeah. he's... Yeah. So I'm a fan. He's, I'm going to knock you with spark out. We'll see what happens. I'm going to knock you spark out. We'll see, we'll see what happens. You're getting it. You're getting it. it. You're getting it's easy it. to talk a big game. It's easy to talk a big game, yeah? And you know when he keeps saying, you're very bitter. You're very bitter. I'm here to put you to sleep. That's what I'm here to do. Which part have I never turned on? No, but... You're being oh, Listen, I'm going to make sure you turn up for that. Throughout the 2010s, negotiations crumpled as soon as they began, with both men attacking each other in the media. Now, with the fight set for 2022, the animosity intensified. I'm worried about Kel's health after the beating I'm going to be giving him. This is personal, isn't it? Is this personal? This is personal. In its classic Victorian way, the British Boxing Board of Control ruined the fight by impeding both men from trash talking. But by then, the stage had been set, and even the most skeptical boxing fan became interested in the fight. Coming into the bout, Khan hired Brian McIntyre, trainer of Ferris Crawford. McIntyre was enjoying an elevated reputation based on his association with one of the top five pound for pound fighters in the world. And Khan felt that having the man that had helped Crawford defeat him and his enemy would serve as a tactical asset. Brooks trainer, Dominic Gingle, appeared to agree with the selection. Got Brian, who's training him here, former boxer, very good, good knockout ratio, 63%. Unfortunately, it was him getting knocked out, and that's probably why it's going to work with him and Khan, because he can probably tore Khan away through them. Knockdowns that he had. So, well, Kel don't have nothing left in that tank. You reckon? You, reckon, you know yeah. that. You know that. That's just going yeah. through the motion. Oh, oh, yeah. He shot. Listen, he shot. And although Khan was undoubtedly the bigger draw, many fans disliked his decision of imposing a 149 pound catch weight on Brook. This is because Brook had been struggling to make 147 since the Spence fight back in 2017 and had looked much better at 154 pounds. As it often happens in life, a strange omen was detected by fans as Khan made his way to the ring. There, he passed by an ambulance, a vehicle he was intimately acquainted with. There was no filling out round, as both men started swinging. Khan, although looking quick, appeared unhinged as he fumbled in. Two minutes into the fight, Brooks stunned Khan. Brooke continued landing bombs, while Khan's offense proved ineffective, his timing clearly off. And even when he landed, Khan failed to earn Brooke's respect. Brooke continued manhandling the staggering Khan, and the ref halted the beating in the sixth. Although the stoppage appeared premature, Khan was complacent. The fight was a success both at the gate and on pay-per-view. The second surprise of the night was that Khan, owner of one of the worst chains of recent years, never hit the canvas. But as surprises were still coming, days after the bout, Khan voiced his desire for a rematch. Even his promoter advised against the idea. Thankfully, Khan came to his senses days later and announced his retirement. In the end, neither man had anything to be ashamed of. Although having been plastered in his final bout, Khan had accomplished more than the average boxer, both as a professional and as an amateur. Brooke, meanwhile, finally got his win over his rival and looked ahead for one last shot at the title. And fans received official closure on one of the best rivalries in British boxing. With the exception of Arthur Beterbiev, no other prime fighter could nickname themselves the Monster. But for the past nine years, that's exactly how Naoya Inoue has been acting. Starting a junior flyweight, 
Inoue Decision Future Champion Ryochi Teguchi. From there, the monster tore through two more divisions, stopping veterans and contenders with ease. In late 2018, he signed on to the World Super Series of Boxing Bantamweight Tournament and easily dispatched the best contenders in less than three combined rounds. But in the final, Inoue was forced to show more than punching power, as he met fellow banger Nonito Donaire. Donaire had been enjoying a career renaissance by dropping back to 118 pounds and he proceeded to give Inoue his toughest fight ever, rising from an 11th round knockdown and fracturing his right orbital bone. Then, Inoue signed a co-promotional deal with top-ranked promotions, in the hopes that the promotional behemoth would expand his clout. But Inoue's rampage slowed to a crawl in 2020, when the global pandemic reduced him to fighting once that year, a six-round trouncing of Australian contender Jason Maloney. Then, he wasted 2021 by disposing of two nondescript opponents. Now overtaken in the pound for pound rankings by more active fighters, Inoue signed to rematch Donaire in 2022. Since losing to Inoue, Donaire had taken 2020 off before rebounding in 2021. First, he stopped the undefeated title holder Nordin Ubali, followed by a stoppage over another younger undefeated fighter in Raymart Kebayo. Donaire brought momentum with him, while Inoue's career stagnated. Perhaps the monster was about to be slain. From the opening bell, both power punchers were cautious, but they fired with intensity. Then, near the end of the first, Inoue displayed his power. <laughs> cautious of Donaire's power, Inoue began the second slowly, but soon his power resurfaced. So, once again, he knew a dispatch of a world-class threat in under two rounds. And after two years off the radar, he proved that even amongst the pound-for-pound -pound fighters, he was uncommon among the uncommon. When looking at a prospect, many fans are impressed by flashy footwork and hand speed. But oftentimes, the sport of boxing soon exposes these men, as the quality of competition increases and fans are soon treated to fighters refusing to engage, content to jab and clinch their way to a decision. For Jesse Bama Rodriguez, 15-0 with 10 knockouts, proving he was a puncher across all levels remained a crucial task. This kid is phenomenal. He really is. In February 2022, a 22-year-old prospect stepped in on five days' notice to fight veteran Carlos Quadras, moving up a division as he did so. The win raised his profile. But the real test would come against former champion Wixak Seal Wangek. The tie had defeated two of the best super flyweights of his generation, knocking out Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez and outpointing Juan Francisco Estrada.
Wangek then lost his strand rematch in a bizarre fight, in which he abandoned his usual southpaw style and fought as an orthodox fighter for most of the bout. But he'd since notched three straight wins. And though he hadn't fought in a year, Wang Gek remained the biggest puncher Rodriguez had ever faced, not to mention a man with a granite chin and plenty of experience. Some wondered whether this was too much too soon for the young Rodriguez. In the first, Rodriguez makes feints with speed to snap Wang Gek's head. The tie was used to getting hit, but in the second, he started out quickly, seemingly realizing he couldn't fall behind against such a young fighter. He worked the body, but Rodriguez remained dangerous backing up. Rodriguez continued pecking at the body and mixed it up with feints. Thus, Wang Gek was unable to anticipate the attacks. Bam was still quicker. But Wang Gag landed the occasional shot, keeping the youngster honest. In the third, however, Rodriguez started a disturbing trend of clinching. To his credit, he wasn't clutching, but it made one wonder whether the pace was affecting him. In the fourth, Wang Gag pressed, but Rodriguez continued landing the cleaner shots, and they weren't slaps. Like a good pro, Wang Gag worked the body and ended the round strongly. In the fifth, Rodriguez began clinching harder, but he continued snapping the jab and controlling Wang Gek with his footwork. By the midpoint of the fifth, Rodriguez started to stand his ground, though his punches were losing snap. Still, both men traded until the bell. In the sixth, Wang Gek worked the body while Rodriguez kept using angles and peppered Wang Gag with hard shots. But in the seventh, Rodriguez got the second win. Rodriguez landed bombs throughout, yet he was the one holding by the round's end. In the past, Wang Gag had proven to be tougher than his opponents, imposing his will on them, taking shots and giving them until emerging on top. Here, however, he was taking more than he landed and the shots came from a legitimate power punch. And so, Rodriguez had demonstrated what the real sweet science is all about. Skills combined with a killer instinct. Boxing has had its share of freakishly tall boxers. From Diego Corrales at 130 pounds to Tommy Hurst and Paul Williams at a welterweight, some fighters defy the average height. But 24 year old Sebastian Fundora bested them all. Fighting at 154 pounds, Fundora stood at 6 feet and 5 inches tall. The same height as former heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis and taller than current heavyweight analyst Alexander Uzik. But could the tall monstrosity fight? Erickson Lubin hoped to find out. Years earlier, the 26-year-old had been considered one of boxing's future stars as he dazzled with his speed and panache. But after a battle of undefeated fighters against Jamiro Charlo saw him blasted away in less than a round, the Mercurial Lubin got serious. He racked up six straight wins, becoming the first to stop veteran Ishe Smith. For uh, Ishe Smith in that moment, he... Oh, oh. And down goes Ishe Smith! He also stopped former titleist Jason Rosario in a wild slugfest in which he proved he could come back from being hurt. Fundora, for his part, had not his share of stoppages, becoming the first man to stop the tough Nathaniel Gallimore back in 2020. But questions remain regarding his skills and chin. In 2021, Fundora struggled with the undefeated but unknown Sergio Garcia in a sloppy fight that some thought he'd lost. 
So when he signed to fight Lupin, many thought that Fundora's gimmick of being a walking telephone pole would finally come to an end. His chances grew slimmer hours before the Lubin fight, when former titleist Tony Harrison schooled Sergio Garcia on the undercard. The first round was even, with both men fencing. It was also apparent that Lubin was willing to invest to the body from the start. Things heated up in the second as Fundora increased the pressure. A lot of back and forth. Right Fundora uppercut Lubin. by Fundora. Ooh. Oh, oh and he staggered Lubin. Oh, down goes Lubin. Early in the third, it looked as if Fundora would call it an early night. But by the end, Lubin was replying. The fight turned into a give and take affair. But as the battle raged, Lubin's face began to show damage. But he was still working the body and Fundora's shots appeared to lose steam. In the seventh round, Fundora started out strong, and Lubin's face began to deteriorate. But just as things appeared to be over, Lubin struck with a short left hand. Both men took it easy in the eighth, seemingly spent from the exciting seventh. Lubin's trainer told him to stay on the inside and to work the body. But Fundora's short, constant shots were still landing. Lubin's face was now a grotesque mess, and Fundora was gaining momentum. By the end of the eighth, Lubin's face looked just as freakish as Fundora's body. And with that, Kevin Cunningham, Lubin's trainer, stopped the fight. In return, Lubin's family thanked him by throwing ice at his face. Immediately, the black fanatics rallied to question Fundora's gloves but their lunacy failed to gain any traction. Most people did have an issue with the scorecards. Despite laying a beating on Lubin and outlining him throughout the fight, Fundora was only ahead by one round on two scorecards, while the third judge had it even. But in the end, Fundora had taken the fight out of the judge's hands, and as was his custom, avoided coming up short. In 2021, we saw a slew of trash talkers receive their comeuppance. The legs are gone on Jose Vargas! Potter's got a oh, oh, right hand by Fury, and down goes Deontay Wilder! That year, George Cambosos didn't just pull off an upset by beating the lightweight champion Tifimo Lopez, he also shot the abrasive fighter and his trainer up. Now brimming with confidence, Cambosos looked for the best challenges available. At that point, the lightweight division with such names as Ryan Garcia, Tang Davis and Devin Haney, had become a den of schoolgirls, with all the young guns gossiping and tweeting, but never actually fighting each other. For the black fanatics, Devin Haney, who had earned himself a title via email, was the most dangerous man in the division. In the early part of 2022, the negotiations between Cambosos and Haney stalled as the lineal champion demanded to hold his first defense in his home country, where they would actually draw a sensible crowd, something Haney was unable to do in the USA. Rumors swirled that Haney or someone in his team was unhappy with the terms, thus the reason for the stalling. And so, in walked Vasil Lomachenko, a man who was considered the best fighter in the world. The Ukrainians swept aside the drama by agreeing to everything Cambosos wanted. Haney then tweeted he'd agree to the same terms, but his penchant for drama had been exposed. Luckily for him, a drama of even grander proportions would end up saving him. On February 2022, Russia and the Ukraine engaged in a conflict that would grip the world's attention. And it served the perfect time for a commercial. And a little bit of chili and With the battle raging, Lomachenko volunteered to serve in the Ukrainian military, thus cancelling the Count Bozo's bout. And so, Devin Haney stepped in. In 2021, Count Bozo's pre-fight battles against the abrasive Lopez had painted him as a good guy. Now, however, the opposite occurred. 
and it began with Cambosos' cringe-inducing entrance. Not for the fight, but for a press conference. Once was bad enough, but twice? Spartans, lay down your weapons! The Vervos Cambosos then accused Haney of being a tattletale. But I really don't know, I really don't know yeah. how they let this guy into the country, to be honest. I don't think they let informants into the country. Ready for war, Joe, how you want to blow these bars? This guy is an informant. This guy is a rat. The TFM are left as fight against a foreigner, his own countryman, who was messaging me, telling me all the details, every bit. Tio at the hooker lounge, Tio having problems with his wife. This is the kind of person, this, this is the kind of person. Right? That's a rat, that's an informant, that's a snitch. That is the lowest of the low. You know what? You're an actor. I'd rather be an actor than a rat. I'd rather be an actor than a rat. As if the trash talking from Cambosos wasn't enough, Haney's team entered into this raid. It all stemmed from his trainer and father Bill, who was denied a visa due to a drug dealing conviction from the mid 1990s. A solution was offered, in which Bill would be in his son's corner via headphones. But when that was denied, the alternative was to have an iPad on a stick so that Bill could at least walk him into the ring. Then, Australian customs allowed him passage at the last minute. Now things began to turn, as it took George Cambosos two tries to make the weight. The Greco-Australian then claimed that he might have done it on purpose, as he was a master of deception in the art of war. The art of disappointment would be more like it. After all the trash talking, the only thing needed to shut Cambosos down was a jab. Story of the night has been that jab. It's destroying Cambosos. As often happens with two quick counterpunchers, it's usually the lead hand that serves as an advantage. And Haney was able to pile up points while Cambosos, unaccustomed to leading, flailed away without a proper guard. At one point, it was clear that Haney was the better fighter, but the American was hesitant to throw more than two punches. This was after he'd been widely criticized for becoming too aggressive against Jorge Linares, which had led to him being stunned, forcing him to hike his way to the finish. You've got to be kidding me, I can't believe what I just saw. And although he wasn't visibly hurt against Cambosos, it didn't prevent Haney from grabbing onto him throughout the fight. The hugging might have been a loving gesture, one intended to thank Cambosos for having no answer to his jab. In the end, the American won a unanimous decision. Haney's performance could have been characterized as boring, but Cambosos also deserved blame for being unable to adapt to a jab and for having zero skills in pressuring a fighter. Unfortunately, the charade didn't end here, as Cambosos activated his rematch clause for a fight no one wanted to see again. The press conference for the rematch was an awkward affair, in which Cambosos, back in his home country, was forced to sit quietly by. There was no way he could trash talk after his dismal performance back in June. But it wasn't all gravy for Haney, who'd been left out of both Ring Magazine and ESPN's top 10 pound for pound list. Haney complained and said that being the youngest undisputed champion in the world should have earned him a place in the list. But as Ring Magazine's editor-in-chief Doc Fisher pointed out, it was precisely his age that played against him, as he had prevented him from beefing up his resume. And this, of course, didn't sit well with Haney, who had disowned the Ring Magazine belt. Fisher then said that the champ could mail it back, and Haney then began to play victim, which was unsurprising from a guy who made these types of statements. I'll tell you this, I'm never, I will never lose to a white boy in my life. I don't care what nobody got to say. They say, can't no white boy beat me out on any day of the week. The situation didn't sit well with Devin Haney, nor with his publicity hound of a father, who began to align himself with the black races. In October, Cambosos entered the ring intent on being more aggressive, but he did so with no jabs and by lunging in with the same predictable attack. Still, enhanced aggressiveness alone seemed to throw Haney off for a loop. And so, he began to use his coping mechanism, the clinch. By the midpoint of the third, Haney had already racked up 10 clinches and zero point deductions. Cambosos did himself no favors with his unoriginal attack and lousy defense. 
Haney began to pot shot, and he would have been well served to string combos together. But he was content to throw one shot at a time and clinch. He was never deducted a point. He hurt Cambosos in the 10th, but again seemed unable to do much after. In the end, Haney earned himself another decision, though his face told a different story than the first. Haney had retained his titles, but his inability to improve his performance against a wide open opponent, choosing instead to clinch excessively, showed precisely why he didn't deserve to be in the top 10 pound for pound list. Luckily for him, he was still young, with time on his side, but how many fans were willing to give up theirs to watch him fight remained to be seen. Nobody knows why some boxers become mainstream stars. Some fighters transcend the sport partly because they resonate with a nationalistic sentiment, others do so because they're entertaining. That is unbelievable! But even that's not enough, as those who dazzle with skill and aggression can still be ignored by the casual fan. And there are fighters who, despite their inability or unwillingness to sell, are pushed endlessly by promoters and networks. One such fighter being shoved down fans' throats was Shakur Stevenson. A quick-fisted rapscallion, Stevenson had medal silver at the 2016 Olympics, though he'd done himself no favors with the vicious internet crowd by bawling on live TV. I'm hurt. Oh. <laughs> I don't like to lose. <laughs> Wishing to avoid another embarrassment, Stevenson turned pro in 2017 and racked up 13 straight wins. Despite outboxing tough men like Christopher Diaz and Joe Ed Gonzalez, it was clear that Stevenson couldn't crack. A big problem if endearing him to the fans was part of his promoter's plan. That became difficult in 2018, when Shakur Stevenson and his friend and boxer David Grayton assaulted a group of bystanders. This allegedly after the women in the group had refused their sexual advances. Then, being one of the first boxers to compete during the 2020 pandemic, Stevenson gave it his all in stopping the unheralded Felix Carballo. But being unaccustomed to firing with conviction, Stevenson injured his left hand. Then, against the awkward Jeremiah Nakatila, Stevenson bored the audience by playing it safe. He admitted as much after the fight. Stevenson was a talented boxer with superhuman reflexes, but it would take more than defensive ability to impress paying customs. He delivered against Jamel Herring, and even though his opponent never touched the ground, at least Stevenson had mixed in speed with aggression. Stevenson was matched up with the power-punching Oscar Valdez. In an attempt to hype his fight, Stevenson began embracing his Puerto Rican heritage by placing its flag on his trunks. This didn't sit well with Stevenson's black fanatics. Stevenson not boxed Valdez, but the public relations hijinks continued when his mother started a riot during the post-fight press conference. Showing that brawls are a family affair, Stevenson's sister also partook in the festivities. Stevenson, for his part, employed the classic "What about them?" defense. But just like his Puerto Rican countryman Wilfred Benitez, Stevenson remained one of the most elusive fighters in boxing, and he intended on continuing that legacy when he took on the next best contender, Robson Conceição, a 2016 Olympic gold medalist. Conceição had taken the luster off Stevenson's win over Valdez by beating the Mexican first, despite what the official scorecard said. Being his usual abrasive self, Stevenson wasted no time in trash talking. I already know. Bad is me. Bad is me. I am. I am. I am. I'm be that is good. Bad is me. Bad is me. I'm gonna be good. But things soon went awry for him, as he missed weight for the bout. 
Instead of trying to lose the extra pounds, Stevenson decided to forfeit his title as well as pay a financial penalty for his lack of professionalism. The amount given was $150,000, $50,000 less than what Consensayo was said to earn. Once again, Stevenson was being coddled, but Consensayo decided to fight nonetheless. To the Brazilian's credit, he chose to do so despite the fact that he would have been fully compensated even if he decided to cancel the bout. But the circus was just getting started. The action during the first three rounds was sporadic, but it was apparent that Kosei Sayo's slapping right would pose little trouble for Stevenson. Still, needing an extra edge, Stevenson began to hit Kosei Sayo with low blows. Many of these were occurring in front of referee David Fields, the same man who'd let Shannon Briggs batter an out-of-shape tomato can back in 2006. He cannot! He cannot let this continue! And he makes the bell. As a result, Kosei Sayo began to clinch. The fight devolved into a sloppy affair, with Stevenson hammering Kosei Sayo's privates and landing the occasional clean shot. By the end, Stevenson seemed unsure about his prospects for victory. Perhaps he was dreading another 2016 Olympic moment. But all was well, as he received a unanimous decision. During the interview, he announced that he would be moving up to the lightweight division. Still, the black supremacists took umbrage with Stevenson for posing in front of a Puerto Rican flag. Next thing I know, he come out, he got a Puerto Rican flag. When y'all get these young guys on here that we perceive as black, could y'all please ask them, are they black? I am a black nationalist. I spend money with black people. I, I, I go out of my way, above and beyond, to support black fighters and spend money with black people. I'm just saying. In the end, Stevenson remained undefeated. But even though he tried being aggressive, the fight had been another mundane affair. He probably didn't care. After all, despite his antics, he'd walked away with a victory. Problem is that the apathy he showed towards fans was mutual. But as Stevenson moves up to 135 pounds, the fighters there would do well to pay attention to him. And our advice to them is to double up on the jab and the protector cup. They say pride comes before the fall, but the undefeated Josh Taylor seemed to be using the deadly sin to glide to the top. Since 2017, the Scott had bested top competition. In 2019, he established himself as the best junior welterweight in the world by winning the WBSS tournament, beating three undefeated fighters. Then in 2021, he beat the next best contender in the undefeated Jose Lamides. This sixth round, Josh Taylor scores the knockdown! Ever the competitor, Taylor and I look to the welterweight division to take on another unbeaten foe, the man some consider to be the best fighter in the world, Terence Crawford. But first, he would have to defend his title in his home country against the undefeated Jack Catterall. Despite his glossy record of 26 wins and zero losses, El Gato had never fought anyone on the level of the elite Taylor, and many expected the Scott to dispose of him with relative ease. When watching Canaro, one noticed that the Southpaw was an elusive foe who packed deceptive power. Still, Taylor, having shown a history of being abrasive, began to trash talk, wishing to remind Canaro of where he belonged in the pecking order. Yeah, I don't think you're, you're ready. You don't really believe that big left hand, you're big whew. Is that all you think I've got, a big left hand? How Don't, are you going to beat me? I'm going to outbox you, outfight you. You're going to outbox me? Yeah. Oh. Elgato, however, showed that he could scratch. On fight night, Cadero proved to be a problem. Cold, cold 
Bouncing feints, he got off to a fast start, bouncing left hands on Taylor. Awakened by Catterall's medal, Taylor increased the intensity, but continued running into flush shots. By the midway point, it was clear that Taylor was en route to suffering his first defeat. But despite his calamity, he was forcing Catterall to clinch, thus a sign that he was having some effect. But just as Taylor saw the ray of light, he was blocked by a left-handed surprise. Now trailing on the scorecards, Taylor's desperation, combined with Catterall's exhaustion, degraded the fight into a wrestling match. In the 10th, Catterall lost a point due to his sexual assault. Point deduction. Are you kidding me? Point deduction. The hugging was so frequent that even the referee felt compelled to join the action. But the tables were once again overturned in the 11th round, when Taylor lost a point for bad sportsmanship. The gesture actually appeared harmless, but the fight had deteriorated to such an extent that such mistakes were to be expected. The action in the last round was sloppy, but Catterall once again landed the cleaner shots. For many, hearing the decision would be a mere formality, but then… Boxing fans, commentators, and boxers were left aghast. Compubox numbers also backed what the majority had seen in the ring. Still, Taylor insisted that he'd won. Did you believe that you had done enough over those 12 rounds to keep hold of your belt? Yeah, 100%. I believe I got the win, 100% got the win. Following the fallout, the British Boxing Board of Control issued an investigation. But all that happened was that one of the judges, Ian John Lewis, was downgraded. Some even went on to report the awful decision to the police department. For many, such actions were comical. But for others, these type of drastic measures were required to shock people into taking action against incompetent or corrupt referees. Taylor would later claim that making 140 pounds had not hindered him, but then admitted that he was taking something out of him. He also said that he would not give Catterall a rematch. See, I don't think there is any need for a, for a rematch. I, I think I won the fight. Then he changed his mind and said that he would, but only above 140 pounds. Another change of heart came later on when he announced that he would stay 140 pounds to shut Catterall up. Taylor would later make fun of the situation when Catterall was dropped a spot in the WBO rankings, meaning that if Taylor vacated it, Catterall would not be next in line for the title. Taylor then suggested that Catterall should phone the police. Delgado, for his part, accused Taylor of having no class. Taylor continued insisting he'd won the fight, even after having rewatched it. In the end, the rematch would have to take place in 2023, with both fighters having fought only once in 2022. But whenever the rematch takes place, Taylor's already lost most of his belts, and he'd do well to take Catterall seriously unless he wants to lose his undefeated record as well. For the past four years, Saul Canelo Alvarez had enjoyed being both the best boxer on the planet as well as the sport's biggest star a double whammy if there ever was one. But after having unified the 168-pound division, Canelo flew too high when he took on the undefeated light heavyweight titleist Dimitri Bivol. Oh my word, Bivol! Canelo Alvarez was a big favorite in the biggest fight of the year, but Bivol showed up and showed up! After the fight, some claim Bivol had been too big for him. Canelo, for his part, intimated that his vegan diet might have been a factor in his defeat. Whatever the case, Canelo's new deal with the streaming platform The Zone precluded him from immediately rematching Bivol. Instead, he would have to fight the power punching Gennady Golovkin for a third time. 
It seemed as if 2022 was going to be a rough year for Canelo. Back in 2017, Canelo and Golovkin had met in a much anticipated mega fight. But the result left a sour taste in people's mouths, not only because the Mexican had spent most of the fight on the retreat, but also because of the blatant robbery that took place against Golovkin. A rematch took place in 2018. By then, the bad blood had intensified when the second fight was postponed due to Canelo failing a PED test. Upping the aggression, Canelo stood his ground and eked out a decision win. Satisfied with his performance, Canelo moved on from the Golovkin saga by moving up in weight. Golovkin, meanwhile, stayed busy, beating Sergei Devlachenko in a war in 2019 before notching a stay-busy fight in 2020. Then he fought the hard-hitting Riyadh Murata, knowing that a victory would acquire him the much-anticipated Canelo rubber match. Golovkin withstood the Japanese Bansai charge before breaking him down. Now, the fight was on. The dislike was rekindled from the start. He's two different people. He pretends to be a nice guy, but he, he's no. He's an asshole. To me, it's not personal. To me, it's just another fight. He's always talking about me. He's always talking of shit about me. But uh, what can I say now? That he's just, uh, I don't know, a red mouse or I don't know. Golovkin even went as far as saying that Canelo's punches felt like slaps. Then, as the fight neared, Golovkin suggested that he felt bad for Canelo, who'd had a rough 2022. Did you watch his fight against Bivol? Just only you no know, highlights. Yes. What did you make of his performance? Uh, I'm so sad. <laughs> really? You no, know, he's big star from boxing. You know, and he looks so like horrible. Both men were generally entertaining fighters, based on their last action-packed fight. The chances for a dramatic conclusion seem set in stone. The man singing the Kazakh anthem certainly seemed to think so. Unfortunately for him, some thought that he'd been lip syncing. Boxing writer Dan Rayfield tweeted about it, but had to suffer the ire of the singer's rapid fanbase. From the start, Golovkin fought behind his heavy jam. The strategy was to outbox Canelo from the middle of the ring, just as he tried to do in the second fight. The pattern continued in the second, with Canelo warming up and shooting his own jab. Both men continued being cautious, waiting for an opportunity to strike. And they waited, and waited, and waited. The war we all expected never broke out. Instead, Golovkin kept jabbing while Canelo launched hooks and appeared to land the flashier shots. At least we didn't have Max Kellerman to tell us he was winning the story of the fight. Golovkin started out strongly in the ninth, but he could only land the occasional power shot. Feeling the pressure, Golovkin continued pressing on, but a body shot made him think twice. By the 11th, both men were clinching. At the final bell, both men embraced. After all the talking, they were suddenly best friends. Canelo received a decision via card of 116-112 and 2 of 115-113, thus indicating a competitive night. But the fact remained that what was said to be the biggest fight of the year disappointed when it came to entertainment. Still, 
Canelo walked away the winner with two victories over his nemesis. There was talk of a pivot rematch at 175, but later that year, the Russian spoke of having lost excitement for the bout. Moreover, Pivol ended up unboxing Gilberto Surdo Ramirez in early November, and Arthur Beterbiev's promoter, Bob Arum, was suddenly jubilant about a potential fight between Bivol and Beterbiev. The next logical choice for boxing fans was to see Canelo in against David Benavides, a man who brutalized all of his opposition. But first, Benavides would have to get past Caleb Plant in early 2023. But whichever bout Canelo chooses, we can only hope that it produces more action than the biggest fight of 2022. There are few things more frustrating than wasted talent, and the 27-year-old undefeated Gervonta Davis was on a collision course with mediocrity. Back in 2017, Davis had shined against Jose Perdaza, acquiring a belt at 130 pounds. But his career has since faltered, as he took on blown-up super bantamweights, has-beens, and average junior welterweights. Some blame his affiliation with the PBC outfit for the lack of quality fights, while others pointed the finger at his official promoter, Floyd Mayweather Jr. For example, the former champion had been adamant about avoiding the dangers of Vasyl Lomachenko as far back as 2018. And he'd explicitly stated that he refused to work with any other company. So, we keep everything in-house. Mayweather Promotions, PBC. I mean, we're not gonna go nowhere and make another company great. Davis' star power was another point of contention. Yes, Davis had headline pay-per-views, but averaging 250,000 pay-per-view buys, the reported numbers were even real, hardly equated to stardom. Moreover, the reported number of pay-per-view buys always came from a boxing writer who cited an anonymous source, thus shielding the PBC and Showtime from releasing the actual numbers and allowing said source to potentially lie about the numbers. A fan used the same tactic by citing an anonymous source claiming that the Davis Cruz fight had done under 100,000 pay-per-view buys. This drew the ire of both Showtime and Mayweather promotions. Still, they refused to officially state the number of pay-per-view buys. Davis had done well in attracting a crowd to his fights with Barrios and the unknown Isaac Cruz. Now, his team hoped that their next event would prove as successful. Back in late 2021, Davis was supposed to fight the undefeated Rolando Rolly Romero. With a record of 14 wins and 12 knockouts, the 26-year-old could talk a big game. You guys gonna see the summer fan? I'm gonna knock this, this dwarf the fuck out. You hear that? I'm gonna knock you the fuck out. You a stupid fucking dwarf, man. And your fucking little T-Rex arms, man. My dick's longer than your fucking arms. But during the conference, there appeared a dire omen. Your history of knockouts in the ring, it's almost a supernatural. The promotion soon encountered problems when a woman accused Romero of sexual assault. Fearing backlash, the promotion pushed Romero out of the way. Davis then faced the aforementioned Cruz in a lackluster fight that he almost lost. Now in 2022, with the charges dropped and Romero's reputation vindicated, the fight was set for May 28th, and Romero lost little time in resuming his taunting. There's no way I can miss you. That's a big ass hey, ass. I think koala shape hair. Hey, you fucking koala with chlamydia, man. Bro. May 28th, I'm yes, gonna knock yes, Javante yes, the yes. fuck out. Despite his bark, Romero was a mediocre fighter, even for Davis' standards. He was a strong and unorthodox lightweight, but he'd been outboxed by Jackson Marinas back in 2020 and should have received the loss. Instead, he was gifted a ludicrous decision. His next best opponent was Anthony Yigit, a fighter with only 8 knockouts in 24 victories. Even Davis knew this. They never talk about no skill, they talk about power. Skills is way up the par. Niggas gotta talk about something different. Still, Romero seemed oblivious. Look, Gervonta keeps talking about these skills and stuff, but I mean, I just see his face get swollen up every single fight. He doesn't really have much skills. Oh, fuck you, little bitch. You scared as shit. Even the trainers became involved in the trash talking. And bullet, 
We know what Bullet do. You don't know shit about me. Yeah, we know that none of your fighters got skills. Better look at the list that I have. Who? Name, Name them. I, I got, got this too. Name them. Tank then infused the proceedings with some more class by insinuating that he could have murdered Romero under different circumstances. I'm coming to fight. If it was the streets, these niggas would have been smoked. And that's what it is. If it was personally, them, they would have been been packing them up, to be honest. Yeah, okay. I would have been at address, niggas at that house. And nigga, you ain't no gangster, first of all. Okay. Shut the fuck up. We do what we do. Three stuff. We don't talk. We do what we do. Do what we do. We do what we do. The trash talking was certainly entertaining, but would the fight be as well? Both men started cautiously, with Romero taking round one with the only clean shot. In the second, Romero appeared to stun Davis, turning him into a UFC fighter. Using the whole ring in boxing. Oh, he took a big left hand and then a left hand. Holding on, I don't know if that'll be a knockdown though. The plan from Davis was to make the natural counterpuncher go at him, which was smart. But the inexperienced Romero appeared to be winning the fight. Davis had his best round of the fight in the fifth, but he was being very negative, including clinching excessively like he'd done against Cruz. Then, in the sixth, Davis struck. Some complained of a premature stoppage, but this was technically a Mayweather promotion. Romero then stunned the audience by claiming that he'd won all six rounds. And although that was ridiculous, he'd performed much better than he should have against the men some claim to be a top 10 pound for pound fighter. The event attracted a reported 18,000 people to the arena, but many raised eyebrows when the 275,000 pay per view buys for the event were reported. As always, someone not associated with either the network or the promotion reported the numbers, using the always unreliable anonymous source as evidence. Meanwhile, fans clamored for Davis to fight the undefeated Ryan Garcia, who was promoted by the rival Golden Boy Promotions. But they should have remembered Mayweather's words. So we keep everything in-house. I mean, we're not gonna go nowhere and make another company great. But a more dangerous fight was ahead for Davis. Back in November 2020, Davis allegedly ran past a red light and struck another vehicle. One of the passengers, a pregnant woman, claims that she asked him for help but that instead Davis fled the scene. A plea bargain was reached with the prosecutors, but the judge dismissed it, thus opening up the possibility for Davis to see the inside of a jail cell for a substantial amount of time. And with that, Davis spent the rest of the year on the sidelines, with a failed prospect as his only win of 2022. In September 2021, the former cruiserweight champion of the world Alexander Uzik took on unified heavyweight titleist Anthony Joshua. Despite the size disadvantage, Uzik had won a clear decision against his celebrated opponent. All eyes were now on Joshua, who after having suffered his second loss, scrambled for changes. First, he exercised his rematch clause. Then, he sacked his longtime trainer, Robert McCracken, due to his lackluster instructions from the first mount. After the Usyk fight, many criticized Joshua for not having used his size advantage against a smaller opponent. And so, Joshua hired the Mexican-American Robert Garcia, a man renowned for carving out aggressive power punchers. 
Meanwhile, Josh's training camp remains secretive, with the giant cryptically commenting about returning to his street roots. I'm coming for them belts, boy. You're gonna see the raft of the new champ. Different energy, different spirit. We're going back to the raw, rugged streets. That's where I belong. I followed the Hustlers, the Rayful Edmund, the Jeff Ports, the Nicky Barnes, the Big Meaches, the Larry Hoovers. It's all or nothing. Uzik, for his part, was engaged in the Ukraine-Russia conflict, and the date of his return remained a mystery. Finally, the bout was announced for late August, and boxing fans sat in anticipation to see if Joshua would fight with enhanced ferocity. The rematch was to take place in Saudi Arabia, the site of Joshua's revenge against Fat Andy Luiz. Boxing fans grew skeptical about Uzik's chances to win a decision in such an exotic locale, but the Ukrainian had notched nothing but big wins abroad, and he appeared unconcerned about the location. As the fight began, Joshua appeared more composed, no longer flinching with each Uzik feint, but more importantly, he was going to the body right from the start. The problem was that Uzik was still landing the cleaner shots. Still, Joshua continued leading and countering to the body, and Uzik took notice. The Brit wasn't always landing cleanly, but he was touching Uzik more than usual. In the fourth, Joshua found success with the jab, and seeing as how he was the A-side, many felt that the official scorecards were probably favoring him. In the eighth, Joshua ended the round by landing some thotting body shots. In the ninth, Joshua kept up the pace, and Uzik retreated without offering substantial resistance. Yet it was Joshua who was clinching by the round's end. But just as it appeared as if the tide was changing, Uzik returned with a vengeance. The 11th was another hard round. Joshua looked depleted. By the last round, Uzik was still plugging away, while Joshua picked his spots. Joshua tried doing what some had wanted him to do in the first bout, which was to lean on Uzik. But this proved easier said than done. In the end, Uzik walked away with a split decision. Although more competitive than the first bout, many felt Uzik had clearly won the fight, and Judge Glenn Feldman, the dissenting voice, had some explaining to do. But instead of explaining his judgment, the man who would probably insist he knows more about scoring criteria than the average boxer fan deferred to his pimp, I mean supervisor. My apologies. Telling us the way right here. Five Anthony Joshua Glenn. Just the way I did. Adam, if you could explain how you swore seven rounds. I, I can't, you'd have to talk to my, my supervisor. What did you like about Anthony Joshua's work in the fight that made you score the round seven five? I just, I just, I, I, I want to just. But things were about to get worse. Ah! He's angry here, Anthony Joshua. Benga just trying to calm him down. Derek Chisor in there as well, not quite sure. He walked away from the ring, but then returned for an encore. Listen, 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 listen. You would understand the passion. I ain't no fucking amateur boxer. From five years old, that was an elite prospect from my youth, bro. Look at me. 
I'm a new breed of heavyweights. All them heavyweights, Mike Tyson, Sonny Liston, Jack Dempsey. Oh, yeah, you don't throw combinations like Rocky Marciano. Because I ain't 14 stone, that's why. It was the first time a super heavyweight blamed his size advantage for a loss. Immediately, social media hounds began the assault. Amazingly, Joshua Fans defended him, stating that the outburst was natural, seeing as how he'd invested so much in the rematch. Of course, they missed the fact that hundreds of fighters throughout history had come up short in rematches, without throwing tantrums afterwards. To his credit, Joshua sort of apologized the next day. With AJ out of the way, fans now clamored for Uzik and Fury, a fight that would determine the true heavyweight king. As mentioned earlier, Fury had been coming in and out of retirement since beating White. Now, he insisted on fighting before the end of the year. But Uzik refused to fight in December, claiming he needed time off. Fury then called Joshua out for an autumn clash. Joshua agreed to the terms, but Fury soon began his diabolical machinations. He imposed a deadline on Joshua's side and threatened to move on from the bout. Fury then did so three times before returning to the negotiating table, insisting Joshua needed him. Finally, the fight fell apart as Joshua's side demanded more time to inspect the contract. AJ's promoter, Eddie Hearn, claimed that one of the main points of contention involved Joshua lacking time to train right after the Uzik defeat in late August. Fury then incensed fans by toying with the idea of fighting Manuel Char, a 38-year-old French contender with zero world-class wins in the past five years. Fury's next choice did little to satisfy fans, as he went with Derek Chisora, another 38-year-old who'd lost three of his last four bouts, with his only win being a controversial decision over Kubrat Pulev. Making things worse, Fury had already beaten Chisora twice, with the rematch being a one-sided beating. Now, Fury was persona non grata amongst boxing fans. Not even his legendary antics could whip up enough interest in the fight. Fury's promoter announced that the fight had already sold 50,000 tickets, but some suggested that the bulk of those were appearing in resale websites. In the end, Tyson Fury pulled a sizable crowd at Tottenham Stadium as he delivered a beating to Chizora. And Fury later called out the attending Uzik. The confrontation was subpar as Fury shouted while Uzik, his English rudimentary, stood silently by. Well, I ain't a bodybuilder, soccer. I'm gonna write you off, you ugly little man! You ugly little man! This was a preview of what the press conference for their fight would probably look like. Making matters worse, Fury now claimed to have sustained injuries, thus delaying negotiations for a potential Uzik fight. Still, at least Fury had beaten Chizora as expected, thus keeping the hope alive of a potential Uzik bout. But with people losing faith in the giant Brit, Fury would do well to please the fan base that made him rich in the first place and fight the best opposition available before any more mishaps occur. It seems as if it was just yesterday that 2022 started, and as we look forward to 2023, boxing fans would do well to remember that we are indeed customers. And since boxing is a niche sport, it can't survive without us. So keep your knees on the back of the boxing establishment's neck, keep demanding the best to fight the best, and never be afraid to praise and ridicule those who deserve it. And do that, and we might just keep this crazy sport afloat. Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and we will see you in 2023. <laughs>